we are the historical arm of the county government. In some respects, I'm a file clerk. I take all the old records that the, the produced at the Morgan County Courthouse and I hand out their name. So anything that you can think of that's dealt with at the courthouse, that it be you know, uh, licensing, probate, which would include like wills, administrations of estates, uh, commitments, and things like that. Also court records, a lot of uh, things from circuit court. Uh, so things like you know, lawsuits or criminal cases, you know, all that stuff comes to us. Sheriff's Department records, commission, or commission votes on their policy. Eventually all that comes to us. And since Morgan County is 200 years old, we actually uh, have records going back over 200 years. So we have stuff going back to Alabama territorial days, our earliest documents, date to 1878 to 1890. So uh, it's a pretty fun job. Also, uh, but that's not the funnest part. The thing I like the best is we have in the past few years developed uh, into something of a museum. So we do a lot of things in interpreting history for folks to come by. Uh, we have three permanent exhibits right now. We're working on a fourth. Uh, our permanent exhibits are uh, a Civil War exhibit, which tells you the story of what happened here during the war and the, and the lead up to that and a little bit of the aftermath of the war. Uh, we have an exhibit that honors uh, Morgan County veterans, and that's anybody who ever served in the armed forces who, uh, who uh, ever lived in Morgan County. So that we take it as a they didn't have to live in Morgan County while they were serving in the armed forces. But we have some pretty interesting stuff there going all the way back. And it's mostly 20th century and, and 21st century conflicts. Uh, but we rotate out what we show in the artifact cases there. But there's a number of other, uh, that looks like we might be a bit. Uh, we have some other uh, things that we show. Uh, there's a touch screen there that has recordings of World War II veterans talking about their experiences. Um, and uh, and so we're, you know, we really try to honor all those veterans, uh, and every year we add a little bit to it. Uh, right now, we've been honoring uh, veterans who served in D-Day, the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and the D-Day invasion. So we've had a lot of artifacts in there, but we're about to take that exhibit down, and, uh, and we'll be doing some other things having to do with World War II and the 75th anniversary at the end of the war. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, with that, it looks like we're about scheduled to start. Um, but anyway, the the um, the last oh, I didn't mention the Scottsboro Boys exhibit, uh, which also is a time period that's kind of covered by what I'm about to talk about today. Um, and who's heard of the Scottsboro Boys trials? Okay, so a good number of you. Um, I'd like to encourage you to come take a look at that. There's been a lot of uh, talk in the uh, Attention please, at this time, session one begins. Again, session one, one begins at this time. Thank you. All right, so uh, a lot of talk about the Scott Pro Boys trials. Two very significant Supreme Court cases came out of that. One uh, which uh, uh, led to African Americans being on jury rolls for the first time. Uh, and the way they established that was that uh, they were able to prove that no matter how educated or respected in the community people were they had never been uh, asked to serve on a jury and that was wrong it was uh, contrary to the 14th amendment of the constitution uh, and then there was another uh, um, another case that had to do adequate legal counsel you know you can't be tried for a capital case where you can be put to death without proper legal representation and these defendants uh, met their attorney just minutes before they go to trial so and then a lot of the other things about uh, early civil rights uh, uh, organization uh, comes out of that trial. So I encourage all y'all to kind of take a look at that. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and just get the ball rolling on this then. This is going to be our next exhibit. We expect this to be done in about spring of this next year, uh, 2020. And uh, sort of in concert with Decatur's license. No, we got one more year to get through this thing because Decatur, uh, the Decatur Land Company uh, started in 1820, so we, we count that as Decatur's 200th anniversary. But this is 
called Morgan County, Pennsylvania. They can send you to 1940. I'll try not to make it boring, uh, but it is a lot. It's an interesting time period because um, I guess we could get on to it actually later. Um, how did the county change this period? The way I like to try to characterize this for folks is if you got here in 1870, you wouldn't know where to go. You know, you would you'd be able to see the old state bank and the railroad tracks be more or less where they are. There's the river. But the rest of everything else, you wouldn't recognize it. By the time this period is over, uh, you would know, you, we could put you down in 1940 Decatur and you would, could find your way back. Uh, it was a very momentous time period, a lot of big changes. The overarching thing is that we're changing from a rural agriculture-based economy into a modern industrial economy. And it didn't happen by accident. It took a lot of people with a lot of planning, a lot of money, and a lot of work during this time period, we had big changes. We had changes in politics. We had changes in business in the workplace, transportation, demographics, culture, and education. Um, and we can just kind of, you'll see these things as we go through, but you know, I can tell you, um, I guess we could go on to the next slide. Um, one of the major things that came out of this is on the very beginning of this time period, reconstruction. Uh, you guys, has everybody had United States history now? Uh, you know, I don't know. If you, I know you have it, uh, but I just didn't know that you covered this time period. But uh, Reconstruction cannot be overstated as how important it was in the, new, the United States, but particularly in this area as well. Because um, you have to imagine, you know, here is a situation where a lot of people who had been enslaved now they're in, they're in society and they're gonna be wage earning members of society. The United States government has an interest in getting them involved in government, in civics. Of course, you have a lot of people here on the scene, old Democrats and people who've just gotten finished fighting the Civil War, uh, who don't really want to see African Americans uh, in government. So there's a time here where we're transitioning, there's a lot of education that has to occur, a lot of change has to occur. Um, so that's the political change we have. You do immediately in 1866, we have voter rolls where you can see this is the first time a lot of these folks will appear in an official record. And it's in registering the vote. People took it very seriously. Uh, this was the first time that these, and of course it's just men at this time, uh, but it's, uh, the, they were, they're able to register the vote for the very first time in 1866. And so they're very proud of coming to register. And that's what this illustration uh, depicts here. You see this elderly man who, you know, obviously proud to be casting his ballot. Um, of course, there's a lot of conflict, you know, a lot of conflict associated with that. This is the time of period when, um, you know, the birth of the Ku Klux Klan, and what the Klan does, and their campaigns of intimidation to try to keep people from the polls. And it's really a, really a testament to people's bravery that they were able to come to the polls and vote. And we actually see uh, some of our first African American office holders, both on a state and local level. Uh, we have the Decatur City Councilman uh, for the first time an African American. So it's a it's a big change. Um, we also, but it's it's not always pleasant because we have, a, we, like I said, we have the Klan, uh, and they'll intimidate people. There's a probate judge who is a a federally appointed person at this time during Reconstruction who was actually assassinated at the Decatur train station um, because a lot of people, they speculate it was Klan who killed this man. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's a very difficult, dangerous time. But it, you also have, uh, you know, these are people who have been slaves. Well, now you got to pay them, but no one has any money. So it's a real problem. The farmers, they have the land, they're still considered wealthy people, but they're cash poor. They just, people see, well, there was a big change in, uh, uh, in credit as well, because you know, you just think, a lot of these people, their collateral was people, right? They owned these slaves, so they're able to secure loans on that basis, so you know, they didn't really have cash money. They had credit, so now everyone's gotta work all this out. And so we come up with this system of sharecropping. 
So out in the county, we see, I mean, excuse me, out in the county, we see the sharecropping uh, system arise where, I won't get into all that, I don't wanna bore you to tears, but it's a system where people who are cash poor uh, are able to get these workers and they're gonna pay them with the share of the, the crop that they work. And it takes a long time to work this out. So it's a big time of change. A lot of people who don't like this system come to the town to work. So our towns, our cities are growing. And uh, you also see uh, the beginnings of industrial development at this time. The railroads start getting built at this time. Can't be uh, overestimated the importance of the railroad around here, especially when the L&N Railroad decides to put its car shops here. For the very first time now, you have a way from, you know, the L&N is Louisville and Nashville, so you can get things from the coast and bring them all the way up to the north. So there's a lot of timber, a lot coal, a lot of iron that's being produced in Birmingham now in this early industrial development. So a lot of goods moving. So it's a big, big deal. And in fact, in, in Decatur, about 3,000 people go to work just for the railroad. But I'm uh, talking about African American uh, involvement in politics and, and in cultural development. There's a movement in, uh, you guys have heard of Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee Institute. So Booker T. Washington is of the opinion that a certain, uh, it does some good for African Americans at this time who had formerly been slaves to have some time on their own to develop their own skill set and to, to get good at you know, both education, industrial development, all these kinds of things. So even though from our eyes today, it looks like segregation and it was, to a certain extent, some of the segregation was people actually wanting to develop these little incubators. So you have the people who are the, the racists who want segregation for different reasons for the people like Booker T. Washington who have this idea. And do y'all know about Cedar Lake, the community of Cedar Lake? No, I didn't know if some of you, I think it's the mostly Austin folks who would be going to Cedar Lake, uh, that would be from the Cedar Lake neighborhood. But just um, sort of south of the Beltline, close to, between the Beltline and Flint, there's this area called Cedar Lake, which is actually a colony. It was, it was described as an African-American colony. So uh, a lot of folks have roots going back from there. Uh, so that's, that's a huge, huge part of the Beltline. Um, we'll move to this next one. So, let's see, we're almost out of time. Didn't time myself on this real well, guys, so you've got to bear with me. All right, so, Decatur, you know, the big, big change in Decatur is uh, you know, what we refer to as the boom times. Uh, Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company. Now, the Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company developed this area that we're in today. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a map that was produced by the Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company to show people where they were going to develop. This is Decatur at the time. See, here's the Tennessee River. This is Decatur, okay? And everything in Decatur, and you can still see this on a map to this day if you can tell what the part of the old town and the new town is. It's, it's all right along the Tennessee River. Everything's either parallel or perpendicular to the Tennessee River. That's old Decatur. That's the city of Decatur. Well, these folks, led by uh, E.C. Gordon, uh, who is an industrialist and a real estate developer, they, get, they want to get money together to try to develop in Decatur because at this time, uh, after the Civil War, you have people, there's a lot of northern capital. People want to come and find other investors and they think this is the time to get involved in the South and we can shape it our way. We can get in these, these areas, uh, these mineral deposits, these huge stands of timber that no one's ever touched and we can get in there and develop an industry. Major Gordon and his people, this is the most awkward, the weirdest name for a company. It's Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company. For all I know, they didn't really have produce a whole lot of furnaces, but I guess that was the big, the big focus. But to, to this day, if you own a house around here and you look on the title or the deed to the house, it says Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company. Because they laid out all the streets, both over here in this part of the area. We're right here, okay? You see this circular? pattern here? 
Delano Park and the water tower are right here. So we'd be about right here in this. And uh, the idea was to kind of attract both southern and northern money to build what they call the Chicago of the South. Uh, called New Decatur. Uh, and it was going to be a separate city from Decatur. The idea was eventually they you know, put it together, put the two together, but for a long time, actually until 1928, they had two separate governments, two city governments, two school systems, two police departments, two fire departments, uh, really inefficient if you can you know, these two cities are right next to each other, uh, but two totally different governments. Uh, but the idea was that they get money from the north and the south, and that's why if you get in this neighborhood just north of us here, if you pay attention, you'll notice that the street names alternate between southern generals and northern generals in the Civil War. And that's because we're trying to attract money from both sides. Uh, we can take a, take a look at the next one, I think. All right, so some of the big changes that we see here, and some of these things are still here, right? This is a home that's still standing. Uh, Delano Park was developed uh, as sort of, um, this was part of the new city planning where they want to put green spaces in cities. This is a new thing. You know, previously in city planning, uh, previously in city planning, you had uh, uh, parks that were really for wealthy people. They were private parks. And you still see this sometimes in New York City, London, and some of the bigger cities in the world. But the idea of these big public parks, like Central Park in New York, some of these other uh, places, you know, so they really wanted this. This was an important part of the plan of the new city. The first thing they built is this grand hotel. It was called the Tavern. And I don't know if you can see the scale of this thing. That's a person. It was huge, huge hotel. And it had like 150 rooms in it. And it had a huge dining room that could seat uh, over 150 people, and uh, it, it was just a, a grand place on, built on a huge scale. The interiors were all done by Tiffany and Company, stained glass, walnut paneling, and the, whole, the reason they built this thing first is because this is where they were going to bring the people that they wanted to spend money and invest in Decatur. It would have been about where uh, Decatur Optical is today, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, um, down in the 20s, but that's a shame because we wish it was still there. But then here's the new schools that were built, uh, and this is some promotional literature uh, that they published at the time to try to get folks to talk about how wonderful the care is. Uh, we can go ahead and look at the next slide, please. And so the idea was we'll get these wealthy people down here, and it worked. You know, you get a lot of a lot of investors. There's a steel. Uh, Glass furnace, which is built right over on the other side of the tracks. Uh, the LN shops, of course, we talked about, and just vital to the development of Alabama in general. And uh, this is where, in Decatur, this is where they repaired all the rolling stock for the railroad. You've got to remember, there's no interstates, right? There's no airplanes. So the most efficient means of cargo, uh, moving cargo, is still the railroad and boats. So we have both of those here in Decatur. Um, this is a grand hotel called Casa Grande that was in fact never built, but it was going to be right on 2nd Avenue. So you see it, they, put, they put it on the, focus, uh, on the front of this literature. One part of the Casa Grande that was built was the Casa Grande livery stable. This building right here, which is not recognizable today, but from some of these walls are still it's now the Princess Theater. So that's now the Princess Theater. And if you look on the sides of the Princess, you'll see these old brick walls. It used to be a livery stable, a two-story livery stable. Like they had dozens of horses in there. So it was a really fancy place. It was a hotel for your horses, is what I'm kind of talking about. Or you could hire out a horse or a wagon, you know, when you came to Decatur. On the train. We actually had three train stations at the time. We had the one that we know about, which is the, uh, the, the famous uh, the Decatur Depot. You had a depot at New Decatur, where um, the Decatur Daily's offices are today. 
Then you had another one after, after Ellen and Shop. So we had three train depots. And the population goes from a few hundred to over 7,000 in one year. So this is a big, big deal. Um, we can pull up the next slide there. Okay, so we're getting new people. We're getting people from other places. Of course, we have um, people whose roots go back here a long way. People who are involved in agriculture and first business people, um, both white and African American. But then you start to get people from other areas who want to be a part of what's going on in Decatur. This is Mayor E.C. Payne. And Mayor Payne's house is still over in Al the Albany area. I'll go ahead and say it's called Albany today because uh, most of the people there were from the north. And they thought, well, we'll name it after Albany, New York. They do that kind of in spite. After years and years of kind of butting heads with the people in Old Decatur, they said, well, we don't even want to be called Decatur anymore. We want to call ourselves New Decatur. We'll just really stick our thumb in their eye named after a Yankee city. That's really what happened. But Mayor Payne, his family was from uh, the Lake Erie area of Pennsylvania. He was a lumber baron. Uh, actually, his father was a lumber baron, and he just said, well, Edward, go down there and try to make your fortune in Decatur and set him up with a sawmill. And a lot, of, that's another thing, the landscape changed in Morgan County. If you've been here back then, you could have driven, when you drove from here to Hartsville, you would have seen huge stands of virgin timber, like just big, big trees in a lot of places. The sawmills changed all that. Of course, you have the, the railroad, that's why uh, Faultville and Hartsville exist. They were sawmill towns and also cotton gin. So the Paynes were one of part of that movement. Uh, you also have uh, Max Cohn. Uh, Max Cohn, um, I put him on here because, but anyway, Mayor Payne represents the Northerners who came down here. Uh, Max Cohn represents the Jewish community who came here. Now there's not much of the Jewish community in Decatur left, but at this time there were quite a few who came to Decatur. Uh, and they came very often as business people stores on 2nd Avenue and Bank Street, and as you go down through that area, sometimes you'll still see some of their names, like Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, Mr. Lyons, uh, he was, he was a, a Jewish man. The town of Faultville, Louis C. Falk was a Prussian Jew. So it's very interesting that you still see a lot of the, the remnants of these folks around here, but most of them the second, third generation decided to move elsewhere. Uh, the kids just didn't want to keep up these businesses. But a lot of your grandparents, if you actually, if your folks are from Decatur, will remember a lot of the stores that were on 2nd Avenue, Bank Street, the Damskys. Some of you may have heard of the Denbos, who had, um, and they're still around, but uh, the scrapyard down on the Tennessee River, that's a Jewish family. So uh, pretty important in the development of Decatur at that time. And then we have the Naney family here. I put them up here because they're representative. They're representative of other immigrants who came to um, who came to Decatur. There was a, a group of three families: the Nanies, the Josephs, and the Shias, who were all from uh, Le what's today Lebanon. Uh, they were um, they were Christians, and this was a Muslim area, of course. It was um, part of the Ottoman Empire, run by Turkey. And at the time, in the late 1800s. Uh, Christians in that area were experiencing a lot of uh, a lot of persecution and a lot of discrimination. So um, these families pooled their money and came over here, and uh, they came to Nashville first. And then one of them was on a trip to Birmingham and stopped in Decatur and looked around and said, "This is a very underserved community, especially looking in uh, Northwest Decatur." The area that we, we call sometimes Old Town. And they said, this is a very underserved community. There's not enough stores here. So they opened up these stores. And, uh, and anyways, the folks that are uh, members of this family are still here today as well. So just a, a little bit of a background of how Decatur was changing demographically. If you look at the next slide. Oops. It's supposed to say yellow fever. I guess I, I got distracted. Uh, this puts a lot of the development to a halt or at least slowed things down. Uh, have y'all heard about the yellow fever epidemics? Okay. Well, the first one's in 1878. That's well before this boom time, but that 
guess they think they've got the problem licked or whatever. But a second yellow fever comes along, and it couldn't have been at a worse time. This is 1888 when they were doing all these developments and recruiting all this money. And in this literature that they've been handing out to all these investors, they talk about how healthy Decatur is. Well, there's a lot of swamp land around Decatur, which means a lot of mosquitoes, which means that there's a lot of mosquito-borne illnesses, malaria, uh, fly-borne Ill illnesses, uh, typhoid. Uh, but this, this yellow fever epidemic started down in New Orleans and came up. The very thing that's driving this growth, the railroad, is also the thing that spreads this disease. So the yellow fever epidemic comes up through Decatur and it killed quite a few people. We don't even really have a sense of how many. The reports are all over the map. Uh, obviously, the city fathers would have tried to kind of downplay the numbers. But uh, we know for a fact that we had quite a few doctors who died. They stayed in town. A lot of people left town as soon as the sickness started spreading. But um, there's, these, there's this monument in the Decatur City Cemetery. I'm going to be looking for next year. There actually, we're going to do a lot of activities out of the Decatur City Cemetery. Some of you may find it interesting uh, to, uh, to look at the interesting people who are buried there. But this monument was put up to honor the doctors who stayed behind to fight the yellow fever epidemic. And pretty much every one of them was killed when they died from the disease. So, uh, and certainly they were in a debt of gratitude. But it was a really nasty way to die. Um, so, any plan for Decatur in the future, people are going to want to look at how to take care of these swamps and these you know, areas and to do things you know, to, to ameliorate this disease problem because no one's going to want to live here if this keeps happening. All right, we can go to the next slide. Okay. okay. Still super important. Um, let's see, I think we're going to go on ahead. What time are we, are we finishing? 10.05. 10 10.05, all right, so we better, we better let's scoot, scoot on down to the next one because I want to make sure we cover some of <coughs> the other stuff. Decatur's a new county seat. In 1892, previously the county seat was in uh, Summerlin. Let's go ahead and go on down. So I'd like to try to get some of these. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, rowdy days of prohibition. Okay, we have uh, Decatur steamboats. You know the the Muscle Shoals Canal has been completed, so now you, steamboats can actually go through Chattanooga, and they're passing to points west, and they go right through Decatur. Uh, previously, they would have had to stop, but but now, along with this increased steamboat traffic and railroad traffic, you have a lot of people in bars down by the riverside. People from other places, transients. There's an area down there called Dead Man's Alley. This is actually a Decatur policeman. You see he's already lost an eye. We had three policemen that were killed in a two-year period in Decatur around 1905. And so that's one thing that led to prohibition. So we actually had a prohibition against alcohol in Decatur before the rest of the country did. Uh, but it still went on. We had bootlegging. Uh, I guess we just go. Attention, please. Teachers and students.